Good evening. I'm Moira Shuri, the Executive Director of Zocalo Public Square. Welcome to our discussion, Can Space Exploration Save Humanity? Presented in partnership with Arizona State University's Interplanetary Initiative. At Zocalo, our mission is to connect people to ideas and to one another. Everything we do is free and everyone is welcome. We publish original writing and convene events like the one we're watching today. Find out more on our website, zocalopublicsquare.org. Today's discussion is moderated by someone we at Zocalo are huge fans of. Lisa Marganelli was until recently our editor in chief, and she is now with Issues in Science and Technology. Her recent book is titled Underbug, an obsessive tale of termites and technology. She has written about science, technology, and energy for The New York Times, Wired, Scientific American, and The Atlantic. Over to you, Lisa. Hello, and thank you, Moira. I'm thrilled to be speaking with our panel today, and I'm honored to introduce our panelists for this conversation. Joining us tonight are Lindy Elkins Tanton, Cyan Proctor, and Melody Yashar. Lindy Elkins Tanton is the principal investigator of the NASA Psyche mission and the director of the Interplanetary Initiative at Arizona State University. She is a planetary scientist whose research focuses on how rocky planets form and evolve. She's led four field expeditions in Siberia and the Mars Rover and was part of the Mars Rover 2020 science definition team. Cyan Proctor is a geoscientist, analog astronaut, science communication specialist and professor of geosciences and sustainability. She has completed four analog astronaut missions, most recently the all-female Sensoria Mars 2020 mission at the Hawaii Space Exploration Analog and Simulation Habitat, and previous missions in the Mars Desert Research Station and the Lunaris Habitat. And Melody Yashar is a design architect and the co-founder of Space Exploration Architecture, which won two NASA design challenges with their Mars Ice House and Mars X House designs. Melody is a senior research contractor at the NASA Ames Research Center uh, for projects specializing in human factors and space technology within the Human Systems Integration Division. Thank you all for joining this conversation. Now, when we think of space, we oftentimes think of cold metal rockets, machines, big balls of ice rolling by. Um, and when you have a conversation that's about how space exploration could save humanity, it kind of conjures up a sci-fi plot that a few of us or 400 of us have to abandon Earth on some kind of crazy spaceship. But in fact, the three people on this panel are doing work that suggests that just thinking about space, explora space exploration can help us live on the Earth better. And you each come at it from a totally different angle. So I want to kind of break that down and ask you, what does humanity-centered space exploration mean to you? So Melody, you build houses on Mars in your mind. Tell us a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> Tell us about how that is human-centered space exploration and your experience. Oh, it's such a great question. Um, well, at the core of what our team at Space Exploration Architecture does is we hope to synthesize engineering constraints for, in our case, autonomously constructed Mars and lunar habitats. Okay, with... Autom let me just stop you here. Autonomous, okay, let's break that down. To... Yep. That they're constructed by robots that are controlling themselves. Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. So habitats that are self-constructed by robots, well, self-constructed is probably a prob problematic phase, but constructed by robots on the moon and Mars. Um, and in, in our case, our work started uh, considering the possibilities of 3D printing using mm -hmm. local and indigenous materials, in our case, water ice, and later we started working with regolith um, to construct a habitat for- What's regolith? For, 
Oh, good question. Uh, regolith is essentially Mars and lunar soil. It's a fancy word for uh -huh. dirt. Okay. Um, but at, at, at the core of all of these design concepts that we've put together is a consideration of what human-centered design can offer to an astronaut crew to not only just survive over the course of a mission on, on Mars or the moon, but also really thrive and promote a sense of, you know, a prosperous and, and fulfilling life. So we do that um, in, in our design work by thinking about things like natural light, um, maintaining the astronaut's circadian rhythms, um, ensuring that there's like adequate programmatic space for them to kind of customize and live how they would individually, uh, which are not always requirements that are uh, th th that are typically given within a systems engineering workflow. That's interesting. So it, you probably have some tips for how we could be living in our houses during COVID time, but let's get back to space. <laughs> Cyan, tell us a little bit about your sort of the, the human side of space as you see it. Uh, yes, yeah, so I am an analog astronaut, so I like to live in moon and Mars simulations but here on Earth. And one of the things that I like to say is that solving for space solves for Earth. And so as we're preparing um, and learning about how humans can successfully live in habitats that are in areas that are analogous to the moon and Mars, we learn a lot about crew cohesion. We learn a lot about systems and design. We learn a lot about just ways in which we can get along and, uh, and advance human space flight, but here on Earth. And so there are these analogs all over the world where people are doing this kind of thing, whether they live in them for two weeks, a month, three months, up to 500 days. And it really is the, the roadmap to the moon and Mars is through these kind of analogs here on Earth. And what happens is that as we are tackling some of these tough issues like crew cohesion or even food and how we're going to eat, all of that knowledge helps us become more sustainable here on Earth. Uh -huh. That's interesting. And, um, and the last person, uh, Lindy, now you are trying to land a spaceship on an asteroid that is about this, if you can imagine if the state of Massachusetts were a giant piece of popcorn made of metal flying through the air, it, not, not air, flying through space. Give me the human side of this. Well, so uh, just, just uh, luckily we're not trying to land, we're just gonna orbit. Uh, okay. So uh, every endeavor, everything that we do is a human endeavor. Everything that people do, we do with other people. And everything that we do with other people, we do here on Earth. And so to me, space exploration gives us an opportunity to escape the narratives that we're all living in right now that are narratives of guilt and fear. The things we need to do to make ourselves safe and better and sustainable and happy and communal here on, on Earth are, are frightening and they feel daunting. And if you think about the history of exploration, it's been nightmarishly catastrophic for indigenous and first peoples. But if you think about exploring in space, it gives us a chance to imagine us as our better selves. We can imagine ourselves as the society we should be. Cyan is living that in the microcosm she's in here on, on Earth. Um, and Melody is imagining what it's going to be when we're living side by side on, on Mars. But by preparing and by doing these robotic missions by sending these, frankly, miracles of technology out there. We see what we can do together and we see the things we can achieve. If you think about the spacecraft we're building, it's, uh, it's about the size of a single tennis court when its uh, solar panels are extended, it's big. It's taking us years and years to build. We've been working on this uh, for years and it has to fly through space without a repair person flawlessly for years and years. And, and that systems engineering the thing that allows us to build something so complicated that no single one of us understands how it works, uh, to go explore something that is unreachable by humans. If we can do that, we can fix our problems here on earth. 
and we know how to build teams of people who can work together and make it better. And to me, that is the humanity of space. Can I ask you how many people are building that spacecraft? All together, including all the people who are part-time or you know at a different NASA center, but helping to, to run the project in different ways, we've got about 800 people on the team. So it's almost a civilization in itself. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and it gives us this chance to think about what is the culture of a team that allows every voice to be heard and where everyone's purpose is respected and where people who are young or people of color or people who are women are all equally valued and brought to the table. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's, I, so when I was just, just a tiny anecdote, which I think is so important here, um, when I was just learning to be a, a hardcore physical scientist, how we felt about our team was considered not just extraneous, but probably damaging because your emotions were irrelevant and also probably in the way. But the fact is that we are creatures of societies and we're, and, we're, and we're creatures of emotional ways that we treat each other. We're creatures of culture. And if you create a culture where people are safe and where they can bring the bad news that needs to be fixed before it wrecks us later, then you have a better mission. You have a mission that works, you have a mission where you solve your problems and you have a mission where you can do so much more. And so it gives us a chance to be that better culture. Hmm. Um. <clears throat> okay, let's let's kind of move on to talk a little bit about uh, sustainability. I mean, obviously, the the big one of the big fears is that we are really doing in our planet. Um, and I wonder how can thinking about space exploration make us live more sustainably on Earth? And um, I wanted to start off by asking Cyan. Uh, well, I'm a geoscientist, so I don't think there's any other planet as good as Earth, personally. And I, I, I love our planet, but I recognize that when we're talking about humans on the moon and Mars, that exploration, that endeavor means that you have to be efficient in food, energy, water, shelter. I mean, space is all about efficiency um, and survival to the extreme. And so all the ways that we learn to do that are technology that we bring back to Earth and we can apply it here and hopefully apply it on mass scale so that we can solve some of these problems that we're facing and make us more sustainable. Because you can't be sustainable on Mars if you're not efficient in the basic survival means for humans. And so that's one of the things that I like, but also getting in Lindy was saying about the culture uh, of being human and what does that mean? And when we're going to in space and this whole imagination and these teams coming together to work and solve these problems and really just push the limit of our understanding and our capabilities, all of that comes back. I mean, that's all done here on Earth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, but it's, it seeds, it plants the seeds of us being that way on, on Earth and being able to cooperate mm -hmm. and achieve amazing things. Melody, do you want to? Yeah, I can jump in. Um, can talk about sustainability here. Yeah. So, the current project that my team is, is working on is, is called the Moon to Mars Autonomous Construction, uh, Planetary Autonomous Construction Technologies Project. And what we're hoping to do through a partnership of private academ academia and, and, uh, and other partners um, with NASA, of course, is establish a permanent and sustainable lunar outpost. Um, so what we're considering is first to develop critical infrastructure for that lunar outpost and eventually um, habitats that can sustain human life. As, as, as Cyan said, uh, the only way to really do that is to think sustainably about the resources that we, that we launch, the materials that we use that are local, as I mentioned earlier, to the planet and uh, make the most of the resources that, that, that we have available to us. Um, particularly in, in my case, we've been looking at 3D printing and additive manufacturing as a construction technology that can add additional versatility 
that we otherwise would not have in launching everything that, that's pre-integrated from Earth. So with 3D printing, our, our vision is that we can not only create that critical infrastructure, but also eventually habitats. And so there's kind of a dual use initiative here in advancing the technology to be mature enough to work on the lunar surface, but also in so doing, we're advancing the technology so that it can improve the way that we construct in the short term here terrestrially here on Earth. Um, it's very, very difficult to disrupt the construction industry as it is today. Um, and the way that we think about materials usage, the way that we think about the way homes and infrastructure here on Earth is built absolutely is, is in a place or innovation should be should be should be fostered and is warranted. So are you saying that someday maybe I'll have a home that's been 3D printed out of my local dirt? That might be the case or maybe it's been uh, you know maybe some waste products or plastics that you might have used at home have up and developed into polymers. Maybe we have um, even organic material that could be 3D printed. Um, there's lots of possibilities in the material sciences and engineering realms are, are so productive and, and, and so exciting right now. Um, yeah, there's a lot of potential here. That's great. Uh, Lindy, did you wanna jump in here or, do you, or should we go? Just, well, just one thing to add to this. I, I think that the, first of all, something that, that Cyan said really resonated with me. One of my colleagues recently said to me, it doesn't matter what we do to Earth. We can have every kind of catastrophe that humans create and Earth will still be more habitable than Mars or any other place that we know. Earth is always going to be the most habitable place. Mm -hmm. And so there's every reason for us to work on sustainability and sustainability requires problem solving. And for humans, problem solving requires inspiration and, uh, and drive. And inspiration and drive need something to spark them. And sometimes it's not the fear of a lack of sustainability. Sometimes it's the inspiration of doing something like building on Mars. And so I, I really see everything we do in space as a way to inspire people to problem solve on Earth. Hmm. Um, I guess one of the questions that I had as I started thinking about all of this is, you know, space exploration is really the province of rich countries. Um, and, and the richer, the better as far as, as going into space. Uh, and, and now increasingly very rich people, especially rich guys, Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, Elon Musk. Um, there's talk of luxury space travel. It seems like it is the most elite of elite elitist things that you can do, basically. Um, and so how can something so obviously elitist be used to address inequities? And that's something that you have brought up uh, a couple of times. Uh, Lindy, why don't you start, why don't you tell us how, how it can address that? Well, I, first of all, <clears throat> space exploration is so attractive. I, I would bet that, that all the three of us get multiple emails every week, if not every day, from people around the world who want to know how to work in space exploration because it just creates these dreams. And there's nothing like a dream to get people working. Um, now, many, many countries are developing space agencies. And I'm glad to say that there are many organizations and people from places that already have space uh, capabilities who are there to help, who are creating ride share programs like the, there's a Lockheed ASU um, consortium called Milo, which is creating ride share opportunities for um, small and growing space agencies. There are ways for, I think, any group of When you say ride share, you mean they can ride on the rocket, right? I'm, I'm really talking about ride share among many small satellites, not among many people, but yes, ride sharing on a rocket. Um, and so, and, and I would, I'm sure <laughs> that Melody and Cyan know many ways that people who want to, but don't come from privilege can get involved. And so I'm glad to say that it's a big enough industry that even though it's driven by these kind of um, charismatic beast stories, you know, there's room for all of us. Do you have anything to, do either of you have, uh, want to jump in on that one? Sure, I can. As an analog astronaut, one of the best things is that all of these analogs are popping up around the world. Yeah, I, I lived in the Lunaris habitat in Pila, Poland. 
<laughs> it, you know, it's just places in Brazil, um, in South America, in Africa. And what's nice about it is that if you're from a small country or nation that doesn't have a space program, you can inspire your citizens by creating an analog habitat um, wherever you want in your country and, and have people, your citizens live and learn how to be analog astronauts and contribute science and research to human space flight and basically get your nation space ready so that when the opportunity comes to fly, you can say, hey, you know, we've got people who are ready to go to the moon or Mars. We have been working on this for a while now through our analog astronaut program. And, and to me, that's exciting because it doesn't, I know somebody who built a habitat, actually, I know a couple of people who built habitats in their backyards <laughs> and they live in a moon simulation or a Mars simulation in a backyard, they built a dome. And so it's really so what's opening so great, up. So stop just a second. What's so great about living in a Mars or a moon simulation? <laughs> Well, what happens is that, <laughs> what's so great about it? Well, if you're living with other people, what's nice about it is that you get to bond and experience crew cohesion. And that's so talking about long duration space flight and how do we send a group of people to Mars and have them get along and like each other enough so that they don't tell them they're along the way or while they're on Mars or any of that thing. Because you know, being in kind of COVID and living with whoever you're living with, there are a lot of challenges, especially when you're stressed out. So imagine when we send humans to Mars and we're looking back at the earth and it's the small pale blue dot and the amount of stress that you can feel. And so your crew becomes your family and you're relying on them for your survival. And it can be people from all around the world. And so when I'm talking about these, I'm talking about if you can see this, mm -hmm. I lived in this habitat right here for four months investigating food strategies for long duration space flight. And that was with a crew, an international crew. Um, we had somebody from Belgium and we had somebody from Canada and it just, and we all came together for four months to live in that um, habitat as if we were living on Mars. So, and did you, did you find, um, Melody, perhaps you can answer this, but did you, did you find that in working for space, you figure out ways to design ways for people to get along? Oh, that's an Are there interesting shapes question. That people can live in better. <laughs> that's an interesting question. Certainly, there are successful designs, and there's unsuccessful designs. Um, from our perspective, well, it really, it really, it's the analog, which would be the true test of the success of a of a design of a habitat. And from my perspective, you know, when people ask, "What do you really want to see happen?" In, in advancing this vision of a Martian habitat or a lunar habitat, it's basically creating, and particularly for 3D printing, it's creating a humans, uh, a, a 3D printed habitat certified for human occupancy, and then establishing a research program that would be very similar to an analog. Um, I don't think that there's anything uh, less than, you know, actually going to space and getting it done that can measure the success of a design. Mm -hmm. This kind of brings up another a question that I have. Um, that's kind of a, another kind of big question, but you know, a lot of the recent talk of space is in terms of conflict. Um, the US announced its space force this year. Russia deployed a killer satellite that's capable of destroying spacecraft. Uh, NASA recently asked for companies to explore mining rocks and minerals on the moon and bring back um, I, maybe a kilo of it for $25,000. Uh, and private companies are headed into space. And, and you kind of get this feeling that it could be this lawless place of war and competition. And I wonder, do you feel that space has lessons to teach us to get along that are more macro? you know, more on the level of countries and uh, 
you know, you've talked a little bit about this sort of interpersonal level, but what, do we have to figure out new ways to be uh, on Earth in order to get into space? Lindy, do you want to talk yeah. about that? Yeah, yeah, this is, this is something that uh, some people on our team are working on, and there are people all around the world and organizations springing up trying to ask this very question. How do you create international cooperation in space when we really haven't succeeded that well of doing here on Earth? People say, oh, it'll be like, like Antarctica, but not really, or it'll be like mining molybdenum on the, on the seabed. Um, but we don't really have a great system that we can export. We have to create one, and this gives us a chance to do it right. <laughs> we have not uh, done it right yet, and I'm really hoping that we will. I just have to shout out um, Open Lunar. It's a great organization that's working very hard on this. And uh, Jesse Kate Shingler, who's uh, one of their principals, um, has just uh, had a, a TED Talk, a, not, not a TEDx, but a proper main stage TED Talk come out on this topic. There's so much to it, and there's room for so many people to help push for the better future in space. Um, do you have, uh, I guess, I, another question I have is, is space a commons? Can, <laughs> do you feel like citizens of the Earth can make demands of countries and companies going into space? And if so, what should they be? Cyan, do you? Uh, yes, I would love to see that personally. I think that when it comes to space exploration and we look at the history of space exploration, we'll take it from NASA, for example. NASA is public domain. All of the information is released. Um, that spurs innovation and creativity, and all of these things. And I worry that as we move to this commercial sector, how much of that is going to be, how much are they gonna put into the public domain and creative commons and, uh, and allow people to reuse, remix and revise and develop the knowledge that's being created. And I think that we absolutely should hold companies accountable that are gonna be going out into space to imagine that future that we want, to be diverse, um, to be, I like to say just, equitable, diverse, and inclusive, you know, the Jedi space, basically. Yeah. And, and what that means to give back to humanity. And I think that, that space, if we really want space to be for everyone, because it hasn't been, it historically has not been, then we as citizens, as humanity, we need to put demands on not only our government, but our, the companies and really ask for them, make them show what are you giving back to humanity as you reach for the stars? And what, how are you providing knowledge back so that we become more sustainable as you're going and launching these great, amazing endeavors? Yes, we're happy that you're doing it, but you need to give back to humanity in the process. What else do you, what are, Melody, what else do you think we should be asking for? I really hope that we can come up with a way to incentivize collaboration and incentivize partnerships that can ensure, as science said, that smaller groups are also represented and that these collaborations and partnerships that form can actually represent the needs of many and not just a few. Um, one of the topics that comes up pretty frequently when we're thinking about dual use technology development for earth and space are the UN sustainable development goals and whether we can act actually accomplish them um, you know across the board remains to be seen but I think the only way to really ensure that it does is to have a very diverse group of people who are collaborating and who are having open and active dialogues about the values that we should bring to the table and what kinds of technology development we should be pushing forward. And do you think that, I mean, how do they, there are certain spots on certain planets that are better than others. Like there are these little, I think there are like little hollows on the moon or something. There are different spaces that are better than others. How are those supposed to be divided up? Wendy? <laughs> there's, there's no agreement on that. 
And uh, it's interesting the amount of jockeying around these topics because uh, there are even countries that are jockeying to be more in charge of figuring out the answers to these things, let alone actually being taking a part of the pie. And so um, uh, the, the hotspots on the moon are, there are a couple of uh, pinnacles, which are points of perpetual light, which is so poetic, isn't it? And there are yeah. places where the sun never sets, so you could always have solar panels. And then there are places where there is uh, an excess of water ice, which is uh, so required for everything we want to do, not just for living and creating foodstuffs, but also for rocket fuel. And uh, there aren't that many that we know of that are really rich. And of course, we're just trying to find out. And uh, I, you know, of course, I worry that this is not going to turn out well. But mm -hmm. I would say that it's a bit of a choice. It's a choice of the people. We can decide like we're deciding right now every day in our regular society, are we gonna look outside of our immediate selfish emotional reaction and try to do something that's for the greater good and understand our place in the universe? Or are we gonna allow ourselves to remain petty? And I would really hope that this gives us a chance to try for the former. To look outside ourselves. You know, this kind of brings up a bigger question, which is like how, well, you know this hands-on because you've all had to make the mental process and the, do the education of learning to go to space, but do we need some kind of new educational system for space? Do we need space philosophers and space lawyers and space poets and space engineers? And does this require something that's like not at all part of our educational system right now? And I think I'm gonna start with, uh, with Cyan first because you're nodding and I know you also do, you do a lot of younger children's education as well as older, uh, as well as college education. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of opening up space um, and having that conversation about um, access and diversity and who should be go, who should be able to go to space because it's been very limited and it's been guarded. And so when I think about this, I think about the conversations that are happening in the groups around the world that are engaging in thinking about the overview effect and space for humanity. And, um, and then you can the get into- effect? What's the overview? Yeah, the overview effect. So this is when you go up to space for the first time and see the earth from space and you know the, the thin layer of our atmosphere and no borders and this awe moment of, of almost overwhelming love for our planet. Um, a lot of astronauts come back having experienced the overview effect and it's fundamentally changed them. And so when there's books on there and there's people getting together every week and they're talking about this and people are coming up with um, the new uh, right stuff and Loretta Whiteside, Space Kind. And I just think about all- What is Loretta Whiteside, Space Kind? She wrote a book that's called The New Right Stuff and runs a program that's about space kind and how she can bring people together and talk about how we can bring the best of humanity to space. And, and uh -huh. I just love that kind of thing. And these are the conversations that are happening right now around the world. Frank Waite has a group that gets together for to talk about the overview effect. Um, but there's a lot of little startups happening in the space sector that's all about, you know, being just and equitable. There's the Just Space Alliance who's having these hard conversations about like, well, where's the equity? Um, should we even be doing this? And, and as those voices rise and push our way into the diversity circle and really um, make headway, I think then we have a shot. Because right now, again, it's the, the people at the very top is very limited, very controlled, and not diverse. But as everything shows, as you open up diversity, you bring more women and you bring people of color and you bring people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, um, you, you reach out across um, borders and all of that, it just makes us better. So you're talking about this really interesting like a DIY teach yourself yes. about space and sort of space consciousness raising. So it's much more of space as a social movement. Um, that's really interesting. So uh, Melody, do you wanna talk about what it, you know, what is necessary for space engineering and space, you know, is there a new kind of training that we need for space to be space engineers? 
Yeah, I think that from from a design and design engineering perspective, if the only people who are ever going to consider the who are ever going to consider or um, decide, frankly, what the future of interplanetary life is going to be are systems engineers. We're only going to ever end up with what we already know. And I think that this is an opportunity today to have a more interdisciplinary conversation, bringing to the table anthropologists, psychologists, artists, and others who can have alternate perspectives of what a fruitful and productive life on another planet might be. And it's only once, in my opinion, once we have those conversations and once we bring those voices to the table that we can start to change that value system and really celebrate those other voices, which from a traditional engineering workflow uh, would not be recognized. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that happen in the work that you've done? Well, I mean, I think that even as I come from a design background, primarily, even as a designer, there is a need to constantly advocate for the work that I do within a traditional systems engineering workflow. It's sometimes taken as fluff. It's not commonly accepted as being, I mean, the value add is not traditionally accepted. So you have to constantly advocate for what you're mm. doing and why it matters. Um, so I think that there's definitely room for improvement for sure. Okay. And Lindy, why don't you, can you talk to us about what you think needs to change about education to prepare us for, to be either space people on earth or space people in space? So this is the thing that I actually feel most passionate about of all the things that I'm working on and that our teams are working on. You know, the, the education that we have was created for the industrial and the pre-industrial age where the educators and the educational institutions were the owners of the knowledge and we would dole it out to those who would come to our doors. And now we live in the information age where every piece of information, right and wrong and indifferent and biased and unbiased is available to everyone all the time. And so what we need to create right now is not people who are able to sit passively, memorize a lecture and put it back on a test. These are skills that are useless in later life. In fact, they're antithetical to the skills that you need to be effective in this world. We need an education that teaches process. How do you write a problem that needs to be solved? How do you take steps towards solving that problem? How do you ask the right question? How do you find the resources you need to answer the question? And I think that this is not just the education that we need for space. And it's a very DIY model, by the way, it fits exactly with what Sion is talking about. And the sense of design, the interdisciplinarity that, that Melody is bringing up. It's not that you just do this in biology by itself, or you just do this in design. You take all the disciplines that you need to go after the, the problem that you're trying to solve. And so I, I think that this is the education we need, uh, not just for space, but for the future of humans. Um, the overview effect and going up and looking back down on, on the world, uh, when you really go deep into thinking about space, you're really thinking about changing our spot in the universe. And, and that has implications for our emotions, for philosophy, ethics, maybe religion. You know, does the space exploration change what it means to be human or change how you, how, even just what constitutes a good day, I suppose, is a, is one, a good question for it. Um, Wendy, why don't you take this one? Oh my gosh, I was just thinking I'm dying to hear what Cyan has to say about this. Can I throw it to Cyan? I want to hear what you say. <laughs> All right, well, let Cyan kick it off. Here you go. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, you know, uh, first of all, one of the things that I try to do as a teacher is to teach my students to not be afraid of change. Um, and when we talk about does it change what it means for us to be humans, humans are changing over time and, and the way we think and interact with each other um, and the way we share our knowledge and our culture, it changes, it evolves. And the, but the best part about that is that one, we can't fear it and we get to direct it. We, we are the architect 
architects of our future. And that's powerful, um, both on an individual level, but on a humanity level. And so we can write the narrative of what humans are going to be like in space. And we, we control that destiny and we can make it beautiful. We can strive for Star Trek, mm -hmm. you know, and trekking across the world, the, the worlds and the Federation or Star Wars. Like, you know, just those two, love them both. Don't get me wrong, love both Star Wars and Star Trek, but I'd rather be trekking than fighting. <laughs> and so that whole idea of the space that we want to have. And, and what I like to tell students is, you know, the most important space there is, is actually this space right here, the space that you inhabit, the space within one arm's length with you, with your brain and your ability to walk around and interact with others and do unique things. And if we can collectively use our own unique spaces and combine them together to create that vision of the future and human space exploration, then it, whatever humanity becomes, it can be a beautiful thing. And, and, and I'm excited for that. That's really interesting, because you're really kind of saying that space, you know, it's a place in your head as much as a place out there. And it that absolutely that, is, yes. Yeah, that, that has these social effects. And, you know, that's really kind of far from the world of rockets. And yet it has a relationship. Oh, surely no. it's not far from the world of rockets because whether you're on this planet or on a different planet and whether you're sitting in COVID lockdown or hiking out in the woods, you're always just in your head. That is where humans live. And so, and so can, we, can we feel that we have the ownership and the confidence of ourselves in our heads to go out and be braver and be more safe? Melody, do you, do you want to... I think that's exactly right. I think that there's a fear that we would somehow change for the worse or that, that things would go terribly wrong. Well, there's always a possibility things could go terribly wrong, but we also are just as capable to set things right. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think I'm gonna uh, go to some of the audience questions now. Um, the first one is, when, when humans make the Earth uninhabitable, how might we be able to escape into space and find another planet to live on? I think this is a good thing to take as a very sort of procedural thing. How would, how would we go about finding a planet to, that we could live on? Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, we, we, I'm going to take this one to start off with, is that we don't even want to go there. Like, we <laughs> need to do everything in our power to make earth sustainable and habitable because there are so many challenges to humans beyond earth and, and and if we are going to be successful most likely it's not going to be in this form we i believe that will actually be some kind of like combination of human human dna technology all of that stuff because you think about just can you give birth on another planet? I mean, we're mm -hmm. used to, and if you can't, humanity, I'm sorry, you end here. And I can tell you that the earth is going to be fine without humans. Uh, the earth is gonna continue on, you yeah. know, kind of like <laughs> the dinosaurs. But for us, we, if we want to stay around, we need to figure out how to make earth as habitable as possible until we can figure out how humans can actually be su successful for generations beyond earth and those are some really big technological hurdles uh, biological hurdles um all kinds of things yeah, yeah. So right yeah oh, to go. Oh, that, I'm sorry I, I couldn't stop myself from agreeing because it's so exactly right i think that we get so seduced by our amazing imaginations and the things that we see in movies and the imagination of hollywood and I don't know if you know this, but 2000 years ago, people were dreaming that they had flown off the earth into space and were looking back at the globe of the earth. Of course, everyone knew the earth was round. It's very silly to say otherwise. It, for long before there was technology. So we're able to completely fantasize about what technology can do for us. 
And we are not at a place where like right at this moment, we can't even send people to live temporarily on the moon, let alone find another habitable planet and create generations. There's literally no way to do that right now. And so we absolutely have to work on our beautiful earth because that is our place. And so, you know, let's fix our problems now because that will give us the time to create the technology that in future generations, we can do these amazing explorations because we cannot do them now. Do you think that, um, do you think that every person ha should have the right to go into space? Like if we have much more common space flight, do you think that other people, you know, will, will going into space become a right or a, a thing that everyone can expect? Melody? That's a difficult question. Well, I, I think optimistically, I would hope that anyone who dreams of going to space would have the opportunity to. Pragmatically speaking, I don't know whether it would happen, but I, I certainly hope that we can dream toward the future in which that would be a reality. I'm certainly one of those people who believes that we should push towards being an interplanetary species and and I love that goal and it's something that we should aspire to, but not to jump back to the previous question, but it was kind of on my mind. I am extremely reluctant to see this goal as being a backup plan for the destruction of Earth. And I think that's just an unacceptable reason for doing what we do. Yes, I, I, I'm afraid the audience member will have gotten the will will have will have gotten the message that this got is the, the only planet that they've got. <laughs> so um, <laughs> uh, does anyone else uh, it's cyan do you want to talk about um the possibility of I mean sh if when space travel is common should everyone be able to is that sort of a human right to to tr go into space? You know that's a really good question but you can look at it at from an aviation standpoint, does everybody have the right to fly? And it, it is human just flying around the world, is that a right? Uh, and if we can't get, even get that as a right, then how are we going to get going to space as a human right? Um, I think that that's a fundamental question. And, and one of the reasons why I like being able to look at aviation and our ability to travel um, around the world. And we have borders and we have regulations and we have all of these things that stop us from being able to migrate. And, you know, human migration is part of being human. I mean, we wouldn't have been able to get to every part of the earth if, we, if it wasn't for migration. And yet now we set up ways to block that and, and not allow access. So I, I don't see, unless we start changing the narrative, and this is where space can come in. You know, we can think about what we want for space and having open access and having space for everyone. And we can bring that back to earth and say, okay, well, you know, if we can make it that way here on earth, then we have a chance to make it in space. It's like a cyclical thing, you know, solving for space solves for earth, solving for earth solves for space. But we have to have this kind of vision of a future that is inclusive. Uh, and, and it breaks down these barriers and these borders and all of those kinds of things and we really become you know humanity instead of saying well where are you from well i'm from earth <laughs> you know i we're, we're on starship earth here and we're all together we're in it together uh, okay here's another question um as space researchers can anyone comment on a replacement for the space shuttle is it necessary and is it something that's even being considered? Well, I mean, really the crew capsule that we just saw go up uh, with SpaceX, uh, that's, um, that's not too far away from what we're talking about. We just started to have a new American way to get our astronauts up to the space station and back. Uh, there are solutions being worked on for uh, cislunar and uh, I, I bet Melody and Cyan have more to say about that. Melody? 
Yeah, I, I don't think that the space shuttle was intended or was ever thought to be a kind of um, extended solution. I think that uh, uh, like just just like Wendy said, uh, the Dragon capsule is absolutely paving the way for commercial space flight to become a new reality. And projects like the Gateway are also uh, paving the way for lunar development and expansion to happen. Um, yeah, I, I don't necessarily think the shuttle program was intended to be a, a permanent kind of long lasting development program. I would agree with that. I, I mean, it, it was for low Earth orbit. I, I mean, it wasn't going to bring us to the moon and on to Mars. And that's what's mm -hmm. great about, you know, as we start to venture further. Um, you can look at it that we've got the ISS and um, we've been very successful with international crews up there and, and now we're going beyond. Well, what is that, that um, vessel that takes us beyond? And then once we get to the moon, then what's that vessel that takes us the next step onto Mars? And so it's an evolving story and the shuttle, I grew up on the shuttle, man, I would have loved to have flown on the shuttle. And, uh, and it just so happened that when I applied for the astronaut program in 2009, um, I was lucky enough to be a finalist, but it, they knew that that selection, whoever got selected that year would never fly on the shuttle. And, and it's one of those things where um, growing up in the 80s and 90s, you know, and, and just being like, yeah, the shuttle. But now we're, we've, we've moved on. We, it, it did what it needed to do to put satellites that we needed in space to help build the International Space Station and all of those things. But now we're moving on and we need, you know, the vehicles that will take us to the next places. Um, another question is, you mentioned earlier the potential for space to become a war zone. What is being done today, both within the governments and the private sector to ensure that it doesn't? And uh, I think I'm gonna ask Lindy this. Yeah, I, uh, I wish I had a little more faith in, in the lovely answer to that one, but I, I worry that there's more being done to weaponize space than there is to make sure that it doesn't get weaponized. And uh, there are aggressive actions, especially in low Earth orbit and outer Earth orbits, um, by by a number of different nations uh, that are that are are basically um, uh, I, I don't know. There's probably some fabulous phrase for it, but they're basically veiled threats. You know, where, where I've got this satellite that can do this to your satellite, and I'm not doing it, but I want you to know that it can. That kind of thing. And, uh, and so it, I, think, I think Earth orbit has always been weaponized, frankly. I mean, ever since the fears of Sputnik going over the backyard, uh, I think that it's been, um, it's been a nationalistic realm. And so, and so I think that when it comes to creating uh, a de-weaponized space or a space that, which is for the commons, I think that's where all the rest of us need to speak up loud and clear. And I think we have a better chance of this outside of Earth orbit than we do in Earth, Earth orbit outside of Earth orbit, we have a better chance. Because it's new territory? Yeah, because there are fewer players and uh, fewer targets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, as we talk about making space more accessible, should the government be allowed or obligated to regulate the production and use of space vehicles? And I'm going to direct this to Melody because I imagine you've done some thought about regulation and specs and other other things in space that need to be that will need to have sort of standards and regulations. I've thought about regulation primarily in regards to surface construction on the Moon and Mars, and what it's going to mean to. Uh, ensure that we're, you know, the needs and the wants of planetary protection are being considered. Um, and we had spoken a little bit earlier about these really high value landing sites on the moon where, um, where, where you know, these are gonna be competed over for sure. But when it comes to uh, launch vehicles, for, for example, it's predominantly a competitive landscape. So 
I'm not sure if I can comment specifically on needs relevant to regulation for, for launch vehicles, but certainly when it comes to surface activities on the moon and Mars, I'm hoping that that's going to become a big part of, of, the, com of the narrative of what it means to develop an outpost on the moon and eventually Mars. Okay. Um, we have another question. I like this one because I'm, I'm a fan of the microbes, but it says, if there is microscopic life on a planet, will humans be considered colonizers? <laughs> oh, I hope we wouldn't be considered colonizers, but we sure would have to think about um, both the safety aspects, which could be immense, and, and also preservation aspects. And, uh, and, and frankly, if you think about everything that we actually know about life, which is very limited, it's based on our one example here on Earth, based on all of that, the very most likely kind of life to find anywhere else in the universe is microbes, and the very most likely place for them to exist anywhere in the, in the universe is under the surface of planets. And so we might not even know that a planet has life until we've been there for a little while. It raises a lot of ethical questions and safety questions. Ethical and safety. Yeah. And, and Melody, have you thought, I, I think that you have thought about this in your buildings because they have a sleeve kind of, do you want to tell us that, to talk, talk about that? Yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly right. It's kind of contradictory because even though, um, regolith as we were speaking about earlier lunar and martian soil is the is is the top candidate for a building construction material when it comes to surface infrastructure and habitats and the way that you know we're hoping to build on on these other planets it's extremely toxic and it can and it's not something that you can come into contact with frankly as a person um, and there's so much that we still don't know uh, on Mars in particular about toxic perchlorates, for example, um, that it's just, you absolutely need to have a barrier between the person and the material. So we're working with the material that we've never handled before that we don't have all that much information about. And so the human health considerations are huge. Uh, there's still so much that we don't know. And, and Cyan, what's the, been the talk about microbes and colonizing around the uh, uh, campfire? I guess in the um, in in the virtual uh, in the virtual landing modules. <laughs> Well, I can say that, you know, in the analogs, there is a lot of studies around microbial growth. And so taking swabs inside the habitat um, on us as analog astronauts, but also in lava tubes and stuff so that we start to understand the interactions that happen. Because you can imagine that when you take a group of people and you put them in a 900 square foot habitat for four months, um, the exchange of microbes is going to be rather rapidly <laughs> moving around. And, and these are things that we can document and get an idea about. Uh, but also when we're going out as analog astronauts across the lava surfaces of Hawaii and into lava tubes and looking at what is growing there um, in those interesting conditions, the same kind of things you know, it's slightly different, but they do have lava tubes on Mars and, and looking at that as a possible place to inhabit and definitely explore. And so we are looking at, you know, tiny, those tiny little organisms that can wreak havoc, havoc <laughs> and, but they're necessary to survive and for us to thrive as humans. And as we learn more about that world, um, I think, it will be really interesting to see what happens when we go on to the moon and Mars, and particularly Mars, because um, like Lindy was saying, we really won't know until we actually probably will get there. And then what do you do? You're already there. Right. You know? yeah. And so it's one of those things of th that relationship is yet to be determined. Yeah. That is really interesting. Um, and and we, are, we have just one more question before we close. Um, we're starting to wrap up here. And uh, what I would like to know is what are the questions that we need to be asking now 
about going into space that we're not asking. Oh. Diane? I would say the question, the big question is, what does a just, equitable, and diverse and inclusive space look like? Um, and, and let's start defining that and then striving to have that become the reality. Yeah, my question goes along with that one, which is, as we achieve more and more in space exploration, how do we make sure that the benefits accrue more evenly to those who are on Earth? I agree with both of those questions. <laughs> I would also I would also add, how can we ensure that the institutions who are who have and are newly contributing to this narrative of space exploration are passing down knowledge in a way that will ensure that younger generations can actually contribute equally and in a fair way um, to what the future will bring. That's good. Thank you. I feel that very personally, actually. Yeah. So, yeah. I hear you. Open educational yeah. resources or open access, open yeah. space. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Explain, explain what you mean there. This, that this needs to be much more open for people? Well, yeah. I think that right now, as I was saying earlier, NASA is public domain. And I mean, anyone, someone around the world can go and access NASA's data and information that there's power in that, there's inspiration in that. Um, and there's the real potential that we're gonna lose a lot of that as it switches to more of a commercial endeavor. And, and that, will, that won't benefit us and humanity. So that's one of the things that we really need to guard is the open source nature of it. Yeah. Wow, this has been a really fun and interesting and inspiring and um, what did you say it over overboarding conversation What the um, when overview. you overview. overview effect, overview effect sort of conversation. Um, we have to end here for tonight. Thank you to all of you for sharing your insights with us. It's been an excellent conversation. And thank you very much to the audience as well. Uh, this video will remain at zocalopublicsquare.org and on the Zocalo podcast. Zocalo also publishes a summary of the discussion and short interviews with everyone on the panel, which you'll be able to read by tomorrow. You can also find other articles and essays at zocalopublicsquare.org. Once again, we'd like to thank the Arizona State University Interplanetary Initiative, which co-presented tonight's conversation, and everyone watching online. Thank you for joining us, and we hope this sparks many more conversations. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.